Today's webinar is one of our Tips Tuesday series, and it is titled Voluntary Control Techniques for Anxiety Reduction. Your speaker today is Jennifer Peterson, Physical Therapist and Division Business Leader for Accelerated Care Plus. Jennifer? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me today to talk about how to reduce anxiety. So um, this, this afternoon, we'll be talking about who is anxious, probably everyone. Uh, we will talk about the role of the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic system in uh, stress and anxiety. We'll talk about the effects of an overactive sympathetic nervous system. We'll talk about some drug-free interventions to help us to decrease anxiety for ourselves, our family, and our patients or loved ones. And then um, talk about assessments and hand warming techniques. So, so if you looked, when I first gave this talk in July, um, the prevalence of anxiety disorder was last published by the um, National Institute of Health, of Mental Health back in um, 2008. And it was data from 2001 to 2003. And obviously that data is out of date and we'll talk about the current data. But one of the things that was shown that was really interesting in this data mm -hmm. is that the highest amount of anxiety disorder was in the age group between 18 and 24 in the United States. And um, there was a high incidence of anxiety disorder among US adults back then. So fast forward to 2020 and what we see, um, this is a, a really interesting article published on the CDC website, they have a monthly morbidity and morta mortality report. And this was published August of August 14th of 2020. And the interesting thing about this study is they looked at anxiety this year in June, which we remember back to June, it seems like a long time ago, but we still had a lot of stay in place orders in place. And what they found, and they went, they kind of wanted to see the impact of that on humans, and this is specific to the U.S. And what they found is that at that moment in time, which was June 24th through 30th, 40% of U.S. adults were reporting struggling with some sort of mental health or substance use during this pandemic. So um, that was three times the number, same time period in 2019, of um, people with anxiety symptoms. It was four times the number of depression symptoms. Uh, one in 10 people surveyed, and it was a survey, the cohort was about 5,400 just over, uh, had experienced, one of 10 stated they had started using a substance for their anxiety use. Uh, it didn't go into whether it was legal or not legal. And then um, the, incidents of people who had seriously considered suicide had actually gone up by three times over last year. So um, that's crazy data that um, is fascinating. And the study I would recommend, it, the link is right here. And it's, it's really interesting reading um, just for those of us who are kind of nerds about reading things like that. So um, when you think about the sympathetic nervous system, what it is designed to do is tell us about impending danger. And it's really meant to, the fight or flight response is to get us out of an immediate situation, i.e. my house is on fire, or my child is um, stuck under a, a car, or you know something that really gives me a lot of um, adrenaline that helps my uh, muscles to work better, my heart to beat faster, my blood pressure to go up, to really get me out of that situation. The problem with that is that we start, our body doesn't really understand the difference between immediate danger stress and um, stress that's kind of day in, day out. So what can happen as we become more um, 
more likely to enact the sympathetic nervous system at a lower level of stress, it begins to take a toll on the body. So I've um, put a link on here. It's called the crash course in the sympathetic nervous system. It's pretty entertaining video. I know um, I don't remember everything I learned in school about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, but this is kind of a just refresher that's really quick. So um, the, the system is built again to get us out of danger but it can cause, think about the effects of it would increase um, blood pressure, increase heart rate, uh, decrease blood flow to the gut, decrease blood flow to the sex organs. Um, so over time, if we become kind of addicted to our own adrenaline, um, that those um, side effects take a huge toll. So you can have increased blood pressure, you can have sexual dysfunction, can have um, gastro um, in, 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 enteric problems and issues that are caused by that over or under um, use and under blood flow to the area. So one of the interesting things about the sympathetic nervous system and anxiety is the research will show that the person who um, has more intense sympathetic nervous system reactions will be a person more likely to experience anxiety disorder. So I chose this picture on purpose. It's a clown. Many people will experience kind of negative thoughts and emotions surrounding clowns, but some don't. Some love clowns. They have them at their birthday parties. Um, this clown particular, if you saw it and it made your palms sweat, um, might indicate that you would be one of the one of the people that has a high chance of anxiety disorder because if you look at this clown she's actually very beautiful um, she's pleasant to look at and you would probably wonder at your birthday party so um, anything that you think of where everything causes you to go into kind of a overreaction of your sympathetic tone uh, can lead to an anxiety disorder so when we talk about adrenaline, we're also talk, we're talking about a chemical um, that's both a neurotransmitter and our hormone in our body, and it's called norepinephrine. So norepinephrine is the modulator that causes the effects at the end organs and, and systems in the body. So um, it, but it affects everything. So as we continually pump norepinephrine into the body, what can happen is we can become a person who needs that to function. So if you, for instance, put things off till the end um, because you like that kind of feeling that you get when things are um, kind of, you know, when you're, you're having that increased heart rate, blood pressure, breathing a little heavy, if you get excited by uh, that feeling, uh, if you do extreme sports or even um, ignite presentations for public speaking, those kind of things um, are things that affect all of your system. So um, your heart, your thyroid, your respiratory system, brain, GI tract, your genital system, uh, musculoskeletal and peripheral nervous system are all affected. And I'm not going to read how they're affected, but you can see that the results are profound. Um, there is a high incidence of people who have a lot of adrenaline addiction or overuse of the sympathetic nervous system uh, with diabetes, with Parkinson's disease, depression, anxiety, insomnia, and loss of cognition or dementia. So the effects are, are, can be terrible for us. Now, balancing the sympathetic nervous system, we have the parasympathetic nervous system. So while the sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight, the parasympathetic nervous system is it's all good, it's chill, and it is what causes you know, our heart not to go out of control to be at 60 beats a minute versus 100. Um, and it is modulated 
profoundly by the cranial nerves and then the, the um, last three sacral nerves. So the uh, cranial nerves, if you have forgot them, and I, I always like to ask what people's mnemonic for remembering them is from, from PT school or nursing school or med school, wherever you, you uh, got to learn them at. Um, and you might remember on old Olympus towering top and you know you can say the rest. Uh, there are a lot of different mnemonics out there and some of them are kind of fun. Um, to help us remember. But the cool or interesting thing about the parasympathetic nervous system and the cranial nerves is that stimulating cranial nerves, if you think about stimulating them to stimulate the parasympathetic system, a lot of the, the anxiety reduction techniques that you will, will talk about in a minute would um, be you get that calming or you get that parasympathetic activity by actually activating these nerves. And so um, it kind of made an, so much sense to me. I had an aha moment on why some of the things that are recommended for uh, anxiety reduction actually work. It's never just, you know, by happen chance, it's always related to uh, physiology in my world. So again, I have the same speaker on a YouTube video uh, reviewing the parasympathetic nervous system and the cranial nerves is available to you um, on this link from YouTube. And he's kind of humorous um, in his own way, I will just say that. All right, so there's a lot of interventions that we can use to decrease anxiety. And um, the best one probably and most researched one is adding exercise to your life. And if you have not figured out by now that exercise is good, it's the answer to many of our problems, then um, I'll just be the one to break that to you. So begin to exercise regularly, begin to exercise today and make it part of your life and you will feel better. Um, manual therapy techniques and especially thoracic spine mobilization and techniques and exercises that improve posture and neck mobility um, have been found to stimulate not only the vagus nerve but also the spinal accessory nerve that um, help in uh, parasymp help increase parasympathetic tone by activating them. Um, there's a really fascinating article about how cytokines are, are um, impact inflammation and cytokines which happen with the inflammatory process have really been linked to depression and anxiety. And if you think about what happens when you have inflammation in your body and the way you feel, um, many of the same side effects or, or indications are present with people who are depressed. So you want to lay down, you want to, um, you, your, um, your ability to ward off um, infections is decreased. So any inflammation that someone has, um, in my opinion, needs to be uh, looked at and addressed immediately. And if you have seen um, ACP's tip of the month on uh, or course on here on the science behind diathermy, um, it is a very impactful a methodology to decrease inflammation. And um, in Europe, they're actually using diathermy right now for the effects of COVID. So um, there's just some really interesting studies out there. So when you look at um, things like controlled diaphragmatic breathing, uh, the diaphragm is actually innervated by C4 to C6, and so um, diaphragmatic breathing uh, actually moves the vagus nerve. And so if you ever wondered why diaphragmatic breathing can help, it's the increase in parasympathetic activity due to that. Relaxation techniques, mindfulness, there's a lot of research on neuroplasticity and the effect of the brain, the effect of saying things out loud, writing things down, um, and how your mind um, generates positive and negative energy 
um, and gratitude is involved with this whole system and how the there's extreme science behind the fact that we kind of create our own brain to either be positive or negative and um, to increase or decrease our own anxiety. So if we can get a hold of that, that can be truly helpful. Um, chanting, laughing, singing have all been associated with increased parasympathetic activity, decreased sympathetic activity, and improved um, anxiety performance. And so those things, if you think about the glas glasopharyngeal nerve, um, all of the different cranial activities, um, you will figure out, you know, so it kind of makes that connection for you. Uh, I would love to have a study maybe done on eye movements and where you look and how, uh, because, you know, the optic nerve um, involvement in this as well. So kind of opens up some thinking and, you know, you could come up with some strategies or treatments that would help with that. So what we're going to talk about today is a technique that comes out of the psychotherapy literature. And in my practice of physical therapy, I had a couple specialties, one in treating migraine headache patients and another in treating patients with urinary incontinence and used these, this technique very effectively for helping people to um, overcome some of the sympathetic tone impact of those um, in, in those conditions. Okay, so we always start our um, treatment with an assessment of the issue. So when you were looking at assessments here, we wanna look at assessing for anxiety disorder and depression. This is really important operationally right now in the therapy world, especially in the skilled nursing facilities, because um, with PDPM and with uh, Medicaid case mix index data, uh, depression actually um, screening for it and documenting it and recording it in the MDS is um, can be impactful in the rate of um, payment per day per patient. So getting good assessment tools is really important. The ones that have been validated for patients, um, the GAD-7, and if you know anything about these assessment tools that are made up of um, questionnaires, the seven usually indicates how many uh, questions are within the, in the data. So a generalized anxiety disorder assessment tool and the um, depression patient health questionnaire or the PHQ-9 are two that are widely used in hospitals in intensive care and um, for especially geriatric patients. So you wanna find one that's specific to your setting and specific to your um, patient population and age group. So this is um, just the scoring of that. So kind of um, gives you, there is scoring based on the number of foils that the patient would answer and how, you know the score that they give. And if you would like to have copies of these, uh, you can email me at jepeterson at hanger.com and I have them and I can share them with you, but they are widely available. Um, through Shirley Ryan Rehab Measures and um, just on, online in general, and they're available for free. All right, so if you want to do a specific assessment of hand, hand temperature, um, these are skin temperature measurements, and you can use a, a skin temperature thermometer. There's infrared. And the stress thermometer is actually one that has a, has a little um, piece on it that you can either tape or have your patient hold in their hand. Usually we taped it in their hand and it will give you their, their skin temperature. So um, cold temperature in my experience and in the literature is 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas normal body temperature, skin temperature, 
is typically in the 94 to 96 range. Now with the technique that I'm about to show you, I have seen patients, I've done it myself, um, increase their hand temperature from in the 70s to in the 90s pretty routinely. And the more you practice this, the easier it is um, to increase that, that temperature. All right, so to teach this technique, um, what we wanna do is we want to position the patient in a relaxed and comfortable position. Um, I always recommend getting patients out of the wheelchair for, or, or residents of a facility as much as possible. So um, getting them out of that wheelchair may actually reduce their anxiety, um, but make sure they're comfortable, their limbs are supported, they're in a position where uh, no one's looking at them or it's a nice temperature. Um, you, it's really hard to do hand warming in a cold room, for instance. And then you want to practice with your patient. I've done this with little kids and um, they can do it. So you, you just make it into an activity or a game, but you have them close their eyes. And the first step is to visualize a color that signifies warmth. So whenever we're teaching something, we wanna use as many um, senses as possible. So we wanna have someone look at a color. You want them to imagine that color surrounding their hands. And um, you wanna tell them to imagine it's warm like smoke or light. And I like smoke or light because they're actually things that signify warmth. Um, and that your um, that color is flowing up the hands and into the arms. Um, have them picture kind of playing with it, kneading it, manipulating it and as it gently flows, changing the color of their hands and arms. Now, if you're um, looking at a patient or working with a patient who ha is um, you know, mild to moderate uh, level of dementia or cognitive de decline, you can actually use um, soft blankets, things that are warm, actual warm things. Um, I used to have people use um, warm lotion and do like hand massage in these days where we're not as um, apt to touch people that might that um, would be something to use at your own discretion but you know you, do, you really want to um, give them more more visual aids um, a lot of people after a certain age don't smell a lot or um, taste a lot so those may be the um, the senses that wouldn't make as big of an impact, but if there's some warm smell, you know, the more, more things you can do, the better for these guys. And then um, for your cognitively intact patients, you wanna have them visualize an instance where they're putting their hands into a safe, pleasurable and warm environment. So um, I like to imagine the sand on the beach and it's warm and you're, you know, you're playing with it, um, you could, one, you could use a soft blanket. I've had patients, now that we have seat heaters in our cars, um, visualize putting their hands on that warm seat. I've had uh, electric blankets, whatever that means to them. And um, want to avoid like fire, water for patients, especially if you're working with continence patients. The color that I kind of recommend avoiding, although it's a very personal choice, could be red if you're introducing the color. Uh, red is kind of an angry color and it, um, it's present with inflammation and things that are negative. So um, if, if you're picking the color for someone with cognitive decline, um, I wouldn't choose red. But if your patient is, is um, cognitively intact and they choose red, I, I don't question what they choose. Okay, so here's what I'm going to have you do with me if you'd like. And I've had people um, chat at the end and say, my hands really got warm. So let's practice. So um, hopefully you've chosen a color. Hopefully you've chosen um, a place where you love, where your hands would be warm. All right, so we want to start um, by getting into a comfortable position. And I'm sorry, I'm in a hotel room, so I can't be in my recliner, but usually I would be. And you wanna close your eyes and just let your muscles relax. 
And as you do that, I want you to think about your breathing. I don't want you to do any breathing technique. This isn't practice on breathing. Um, don't count the number of breaths. We want just to be relaxed and you want to focus on in and out. So you're going to close your eyes, relax as much as possible. Think about your breathing and just focus on the fact that you're breathing in and breathing out, breathing in and breathing out. And you can talk your patient through doing that two or three times. And then as your eyes are closed and you're thinking about it, you want to think, my hands are getting warm. They're getting warmer, warmer, warmer. My hands are getting warm. They're getting warmer, warmer, warmer. And you can do that two or three times. Just talk through it at the beginning. And this is, you're teaching them to do this. Okay, so that's the beginning. Then um, you want to visualize the color you picked. So I always pick fuchsia because I love it. So think about um, fuchsia or yellow or whatever your color is. You, it's surrounding your hands. You're putting your hands into a vat of it. It's a warm smoke or light coming up your hands. Play with it. And as you do, you see your hands and they're changing. Visualize them changing gradually to become that color. So my hands are turning fuchsia and they're so lovely. All right. And then I'm going to um, tell them to breathe in, breathe out, breathe in breathe out. And again, I'm not practicing diaphragmatic breathing here. I'm just having them breathe in, breathe out two or three times. And again, there's no set number on this. It, there's no um, right way or wrong way. It's just going through this. And then my hands are getting warm, warmer, warmer, warmer. We're going into that vat of color. And now this time we're gonna add on, we add visualizing that warm, safe place. My, I'm using my fuchsia hands and I'm playing with the sand on the beach or I'm putting it on my seat heater. I've got them nice, I'm, I'm warming them up with this um, safe place. And then I'm gonna breathe in, breathe out and repeat. My hands are getting warm. They're getting warmer, warmer, warmer. My hands are getting warm. They're getting warmer, warmer, warmer. Now, if you're like me, your hands are kind of sweating right now because I have done this so many times that um, they're still pretty good. I'm still, still pretty good at it. I haven't done it for a while. I need to do it more. Um, but one way that we used to teach, and we don't want people touching their face right now, but you used to teach them now to put their hands on their face and see if they're warm or cold or um, for, when they're doing it on their own. And um, in your clinic, you can actually take the hand temperature and you can um, measure how much they've warmed up. Now, um, so these days I I would say have them touch like the upper part of their neck um, and keep their hands away from their face. And obviously we would want them to wash their hands before and after, use hand sanitizer, all the things that keep them safe and out of anxiety. So uh, that's, that, that's my training for you for today. It's really quick. And hopefully you learned a new technique that you can use for relaxation for yourself, your patients, and your friends. Um, be the life of the next party. Jennifer, thank you for an excellent presentation. I feel very relaxed right now. Hope everyone else does as well. Um, and stay safe and healthy out there. We appreciate all that you do every day and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you everyone.